partner in the firm of Parles Reckham. We're a Clark, New Jersey law firm that has a statewide practice. We represent individuals with disabilities and their families in a variety of cases, anything from early intervention, insurance cases, school district, adult services. In adult services, we have a particular um, I would say interest in individuals with challenging behaviors and also in looking at housing options. So today's topic is key questions when selecting. So if you're out looking at programs to make, trying to make a decision or in some circumstances, perhaps even creating, because we have a number of groups in our practice of families that are looking at actually starting new programs, um, particularly some innovative housing uh, programs as well. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at individuals with autism, intellectual disabilities and challenging behaviors and um, have a lot of slides. The slides will be available on on our website. Um, so at the end, we'll run a little bit quickly, probably through the second half of the slides, because I do like to address two different topics when we do this topic. One is from a programming perspective. So giving parents suggestions of things that they can ask when they're looking at a programming in terms of how things are essentially run. Um, but also too, people often have questions about the structure of the building itself when we're talking about residential. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the federal rules uh, and New Jersey and about what um, we can currently build in New Jersey, which I'm not gonna bury the lead. I'll tell you the good news is a variety of settings are being approved in New Jersey. So it's, it's really exciting times here. Okay, so let's get started. Next slide, please. So um, I, these are three three um, organizations that I highly recommend, particularly if you're interested in programming that has a residential component. There are a number of groups that worked really hard on the federal level. We did have a couple of years where the feds were more restrictive, and then there was a lot of confusion in the states as well. Uh, and these really were some per, really premier advocacy groups that um, really made the argument that Anything that's available for a non-disabled person should be available for a disabled person. Obviously, I was making the point, one size doesn't fit all. So we wanted things like clusters, campuses, intentional communities, farmsteads, um, all available. Uh, and the community that came together were really individuals, family members, advocates that um, we're looking at cases that involve complex medical needs or behavioral challenges. So I highly recommend these groups too. I'm actually on the board of directors of the National Council of Severe Autism, so I direct your attention to that. They have a great webinar series. I believe in June they're doing another one um, that is addressing this topic. It will be very similar, but it will be presented by Dr. Sam Volpe, who is a PhD level BCBA and just has a lot of experience and great ideas. Next slide, please. Oh. So I would imagine that uh, anyone that is on this webinar is either uh, has a family member or is a professional that works in the field. So um, citing the research about finding that when there are complex needs, families are experienced things such as isolation, exhaustion, safety concerns, and in some cases, really the true fear of injury or of death. I imagine everyone that is here today understands that. Um, so one of the points that we make when people are thinking about creating new programs or even working with current providers and looking at some new models is that while the group home may work for some individuals. It's frequently that just a freestanding community-based group home can't meet the needs of individuals. Campuses, clusters, intentional communities, even farmsteads, those models, you generally have better opportunities for on-site supervision, the ability to share staff. Um, obviously, you still want to make sure that there's access to the community, but we found by literally traveling the country, I'm on the board of a not-for-profit Circle Haven that's working on a project like this, and just through the years of having families whose loved ones are even in out-of-state programs being familiar, this is a model that we um, you know, suggest people take a look at. Next slide, please. So the starting things that we always look at the case when an individual has challenging behaviors and particularly in cases where people have um, are nonverbal or limited language, um, or even if they have language, but just aren't really able to articulate it is ruling out medical causes. You know, through the years I've had cases where behaviors have 
um, either escalated or in some cases started out of it seemingly nowhere. And we found that the person had, uh, you know, a abscess tooth or um, a broken bone that, you know, where they were not able to report or given their threshold for pain, they even just sort of continue to walk on a broken ankle. So we do want to, uh, you know, as best you can rule out medical causes. Um, do want to mention a group too, um, in South Jersey, it's called the Risen Center, R-I-S-E-N, Sue Rowan Medical School. They have a special needs practice that's really, really outstanding, works really well with this population. So that's another resource. Um, so another important component, obviously, we want to track behaviors, but with sufficient details and data. So we just don't want people, staff, filling out data sheets, but they're never looking at things such as setting or time of day, or more importantly, that uh, it's not just being tracked, but someone's actually graphing it and looking at it and looking at whether or not an intervention is effective. A third component, effective communication systems. And that really uh, includes staff, families, and clinicians. Um, we at, at Circle Haven had worked uh, with Rowan University on a grant uh, looking at, you know, in a residential facility in particular, what are some key components of uh where things break down and we often see it is communication. So with that grant, um, they that the uh, people on the grant, including grad students, along with the professors, visited a number of settings, talked to direct support professionals, staff and family members to look at their needs. Um, and we think that this is really, really important uh, to make sure that there's adequate shift notes that can be shared. And also there's a way to communicate, make sure everyone's reading it, things like, uh, you know, the doctor said no more orange juice because it's leading to heartburn. Make sure that that is gotten to everyone. One of the systems that we're using, it actually, the, the everyone has to actually read it and like it. And you can certainly go back and look to make sure that everyone is following through with that and that they're acknowledging that. Uh, another thing, the value of prompts and checklists for staffs. This um, are ideas that we've seen from a number of other programs that, you know, no matter how big you document it, no matter how much shadowing you do, how much training you do, sometimes just having something literally right there. So for instance, maybe an individual needs certain things in their backpack before they go out in the community, like a change of clothes or a baby wipe, something like that, that where the backpack that's hung up, put a put a list of everything that has to be in it. So when it's someone's uh, job to do that, they know to check. We've also done other checklist things too, that again, when you have a, a individual serve that may not be able to tell you um, that somebody at night before they put people to bed, they take a look at the weather report, especially this time of year, right? And again, the fall, some nights you need heat, some nights you need AC, some nights you need nothing, um, but making sure that that's actually a, is assigned to someone. So um, in the pilot house that we've been doing, we've, we've uh, you know, really incorporated a number of checklists and assigned staff in particular positions. In terms of training, having a shadowing component. So again, we know that these behavior intervention plans can be just voluminous. So they're important. It's very important to have things in a written format, but you really, in order to train, you really need to have a new staff member shadow an experienced staff member for a period of time. So they can see that in play, watch interactions, see if there is a behavior, you know, what the, what the, uh, um, you know what the plan has in place in order to in order to address it. Another thing we've seen at programs is parents doing intro videos. So they can be short, they can be 10, 15 minutes, um, but where the parents get to sit down and just talk about their individual. Um, at Circle Haven, we've been doing them a little bit longer, about 25 minutes. Uh, again, we want everyone to, have, of course, have meetings and meet with each other, but sometimes giving the parent an opportunity to talk about their child, their strengths, their weaknesses, their likes, a the little bit of their history, a little bit about their family. I think it just is an opportunity to provide more relevant information and to make that connection. Uh, next slide, please. So really important component is the fact that you have a behavior analyst on it. Now, 
lots of programs, particularly in New Jersey, we've seen a giant proliferation once insurance began to pay for the services of, of the ABA and particularly behavior analysts. A lot of companies are coming in and doing it. Um, I, I think that uh, both the state and even Department of Ed and DDD is sees that you can get results when you have a skilled professional. So we're seeing more and more programs using it. But the thing that's really important is that just having someone in the program, it's not enough. They have to not have an insane, you know, this voluminous, crazy caseload that they're not able to really provide the quality services that will effectuate change that will enhance someone's life. And um, there's not a set number that's ever meant. It's really more about that you should, the, the professional needs to have a competency. So I call them baby BCBAs. If it's a BCBA that literally like just graduated from their program and has only worked with three-year-olds teaching colors that often does not work with, uh, you know, an older person, they're not going to have the experience. So you want to look at competency and also caseloads. And the way the association, the licensing body looks at it is that you have to, if, if your caseload impedes your ability to deliver quality services, then, you know, that is a problem. And in some circumstances, BCBAs will speak up, but not always. Next slide, please. So if you're looking at a program or if you're thinking about setting one up, um, often families will tell me that, oh yeah, the program has a, no, they have a behavior analyst. But particularly in the adult services world, although we see it sometimes in under 21 as well, is that they the term is thrown around loosely. So they may say someone is a behavior specialist or a behaviorist, or I haven't had one where it was a special specialist overseeing the program. Uh, I'm not saying that just the fact that someone has a BCBA degree, that that means they are going to be skilled and qualified, but if you find someone that has that and both the qualifications and the experience and the skills, I think it is really important because that field does um, set a number of standards in terms of, you know, the, that they met taking data and reviewing data and changing plans when they're not working. So you, you want to ask specifically, is there a BCBA? Asking how many cases is the BCBA responsible for? So some of the large agencies, they have a lot of BCBAs, but they're in leadership roles. They're not really spending spending time directly with the individuals. So that's that third question that I suggest answering. You know, how many hours a month does the BCBA spend directly observing or working or teaching with the person served? You don't want someone sitting in office and just taking the data sheets, making it into a graft and not really uh, seeing what's going on. Um, now, actually, I have a couple of points here, but I do want to stop for one moment to make a point. I'm not saying to you that there's a program out there that every one of these questions is answered the way that we want it to be answered. So I don't want people to be thinking, oh, our program doesn't have that, you know, this is terrible, or I need to move them to somewhere. This is literally all the elements that in the years of my practice, in the years of visiting programs, we have in our practice, children and adults in many, many programs in out of state, um, also in some of the work that Circle Haven did with their professional advisory board. So you may not have a program that has the right, the yes answer to all of these, but it's important to raise them because sometimes I've even had situations where a program has said, you know, that's a good idea. We will do that or they'll do it in a particular case. So um, that question about how many hours directly observing, you also want to make sure that the BCBA spends some time in the residential program when the person serves is actually present. They just don't go visit and talk to staff, right? Uh, another important question, how they coordinate information with the day program. So um, I've seen it work where there's a different provider for day um, program and residential. Um, personally, I think it's better when it's one agency because then there's a similar approach, a similar philosophy. Uh, although even sometimes you don't have the coordination, even though it's the same agency. So that's something that you want to you want to ask about and talk about putting it in place. And then the other key areas: how is information shared with family and how frequently? So those are sort of our broad categories. Next question. Next slide. Sorry. So when you have do have a BCBA on uh, the team, we want to ask about 
do they do a functional behavior analysis? So just taking data alone is not necessarily a formal analysis. So that is something that you want to ask about. If someone has a behavior that has, um, you know, wor been worsening or just not changing in the in the direction of reducing, um, making for a more safe situation, I, and asking like, how long is it acceptable for a behavior intervention plan to remain in place if it's not working? And this is not just residential, not just adults. I see it in, um, you know, educational settings, for, in children's settings, sometimes even in home programs. So those are questions that you want to ask. Another thing too, as we traveled the country and encountered programs that we were impressed with. Um, and also there are some autism schools in New Jersey that are, do this as well, is that they allow outside consultants to come in. So either A, that the family says, you know, I have someone that's done, uh, you know, see my child, see my loved one, I would like them to come in. Um, I, I think the fact that someone is letting someone else in is usually a good sign. Um, you have to be careful though, because if you come someone in and bulldozes through it, there's not a work, good working relationship. So I think in picking that appropriate expert. Uh, so they do work collaboratively with uh, the program. Um, another question to ask is, you know, if they are going to do an, ass an assessment like an FBA, how long will it take for it to be completed? And will the family get a copy? I mean, I've sat at so many IEPs and ISPs where they're talking about an assessment and we don't have a copy of it. So we want to uh, make sure that the family is provided with it. Our assessments also used to um, identify goals. So it's, assessments are not just about behaviors and a good behavior now analyst is not just looking at the behavior, they're looking at the function of the behavior and looking at replacement goals. So if it seems that the person is frustrated because they can't make them, uh, you know, their choice be known and make sure that you put in a, a choice system, whether it's electronic or even a choice board or a PEC system. So we do want to make sure that goals are, are included. And there can be goals outside of the behavioral realm too, just general goals that, you know, he walks beautifully into Wawa and we get a so but if we take a closer look, yeah, well, you know what? He's not actually getting the cup himself. So trying to look for skills that could lead to more independence. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, tracking progress. So we want to make sure that data is taken on both behaviors and on skill acquisition. Um, it can be something like if someone is learning to do an activity schedule, the data could just be how many items are in the schedule. So you see that you're adding oh, items over time, or how long is the person on their on their activity schedule? So there's ways to take data that are not you know um, trial by trial, like as if you're actually teaching something, like you know if you're doing discrete trial and teaching um, in that format. But um, a border program, um, you know, had someone that a behavior analyst had working with someone to get them to watch sports. It was something that was important to the family, so they started with the last literally 90 seconds of the football game and worked from there. Um, so there are um, programs that can look at things other than just like the item by item. Is the data graphed? Is it reviewed by a clinician? Again, shared with families, right? Sometimes programs have this information, but we just, it, we're not getting to the families. Want to make sure it's actually shared with the staff, both residential and day. If there are in adult services, obviously under 21 educational court, you're going to have goals because it's required in an IEP, um, although sometimes they're not specific enough. But we want to make sure that skill acquisition programs are being run. And also, what's the criteria of mastery? So it's not only that if someone learns it, you want to move on to something else because they've done that already. Let's try maybe a skill that builds on that. But you also want to look at if something has been run for years and years and years, and it's just not le getting learned, that maybe it's time to not teach that any longer. I mean, I can give you a personal example. You know, I'm the mother of a 33-year-old adult with complex medical needs, severe autism, and challenging behaviors. And um, for years, we tried to teach uh, money, coins, all of that type of thing. Um, and he was fine in the classroom being able to identify it. But when we were at the checkout line, he, you know, didn't know to give the 20 because what the amount was, or even if someone was prompting him, like, give them a 10, in that circumstance, couldn't do it. We had an outside consultant come in um, and pointed out that, um, you know what, 
this has been a long time you've been teaching this and it's really just a labeling program. It's not really moving it to the real world in a practical sense. So what if we got him a debit card and we made his code 1234 um, and then the problems that we were having at checkout were eliminated. Another thing to ask is what is IOA data? Um, rarely see that. There's even a lot of, I'd say even under 21 programs, but it's essentially where someone else is taking data simultaneously on occasion. So because if someone is scoring something as independent, but it really isn't, that's one way to know it, that if someone else is taking it simultaneously and then they can compare it. Um, it's just a treatment integrity system and there's a variety of them that uh, could be put in place. Written progress reports, again, how frequently are they done? Are they shared with families? Next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about programming, having someone outside come in, but also some programs will actually do program monitoring where the program being, brings another consultant in. It's almost like they're saying, you know, we think we're doing a good job, but it would be nice to have somebody else to, to come in. Um, I know some of the private ABA autism schools do do that. Um, and I think it makes a, a big difference. So that's a question to ask, either if you're in a program or again, as I said, we in our practice have a number of parents, um, some of even of younger kids that are starting to look at the issue about adult services, residential in particular. Um, and so these are types of things that if you are yeah, creating a program or working with an existing provider to create a specialized program. I've seen that happen too, where the program really didn't have an expertise in individuals with challenging behavior and are now entering into that realm. So this is, you know, these are things that you could certainly ask about, suggest, and if you're involved with the entity itself, um, you know, look at doing for your program. Um, is video monitoring used? And if yes, for what purpose? Um, what I mean by that is that programs that do have video, um, sometimes they just use it for if someone, something horribly goes wrong to see, you know, if someone ended up with an injury to take a look. And of course, that is something you want to do. I think it's one of the arguments for why you should have video monitoring. It protects not only the person serves, but it protects staff against false accusations. Um, I think it's there are many, many reasons to use it, but it shouldn't be only used for that. A good program is going to use it to randomly, periodically take a look at it and just see, you know, is the plan being so, you know, followed with integrity? So say, for instance, someone has a behavior where they yell a request, okay? And the plan is that when they yell for it, and I'm not suggesting this is, you know, for everyone, obviously it's individualized, but just say that in a particular case, after an assessment, it was decided that you were going to have planned ignoring for when the person yells the request. And, you know, behavior's not getting better, um, or it's just, happening more often in a certain time of day, taking a look through a video camera and seeing, well, you might find that one staff member is not ignoring it. They're saying, they're jumping up right away and saying, okay, you know, I'm getting it and reinforcing that yelling behavior. So you want to make sure for consistency of the behavior intervention plan. Also for skill acquisition as well, if a skill is being taught, um, being able to have the clinicians uh, look at a video of it, because obviously there are time constraints, particularly for people that are in community-based group homes, you know, it's just sometimes hard to get to all of them. So I've seen it used for that. I've seen it used for training. Um, can it be accessed live? Very few programs do do that, but I do like to mention that because there is technology. I've seen a number of families that have done self-directed programs uh, get this. You can literally have it on an app. I first learned about it in a program in Pennsylvania where they could get video live. The BCBA could get it right on their phone um, and be able to see something happen in real time. I saw a program in, I, in Kansas once that had actually a video monitoring state uh, station that the clinician sat at so not only they could watch but staff could actually ask for help through the video say hey we're having a hard time here um, and in that particular program they also use video monitoring for people that could live more independently so they would be available via video for maybe just a particular task like you know cooking or something like that um, another question is that if a restraint is used is the video reviewed by a clinician? Um, 
you know, sometimes restraints are necessary. I think um, it is a tool that in some circumstances, it's the only way to keep the person safe. And sometimes it's part of the plan that helps reduce the behavior, but we wanna make sure that people are looking at it. So um, making sure that there's a system in place for a clinician to take a look at it. And if there is an error to obviously share information, not just with the family, but with staff too. Um, if a restraint does occur, how who contacts the family? How long after? Um, even if there's not an injury. Um, so, um, you know, is information on the investigation unit or the human rights committee shared with family? These are, again, lots of questions to ask, questions to look at if you are thinking about working with others to start a program or working with an existing agency that's looking into serving this population. Um, another uh, pro problem that we see frequently is this issue of peer aggression. And, um, you know, there's heartbreaking. Uh, both families are just, you know, distraught about it. Um, so we want to ask about that. Um, often, obviously, the very first thing people need to do is increase the staff and increase the training and supervision of the staff. Uh, because, you know, it's just that's a horrific thing, not only for the individual that is the victim of aggression, but the person that is being aggressive, because that limits their world. So it speaks to not only protecting the person who was the victim of the aggression, but also inadequate services for the person that is um, being aggressive. And I'm not suggesting that um, you just put these few things in and this all disappears. Some things are are long established um, and they may be extremely challenging to even reduce. Uh, so these aren't magic bullets. These are not, you know, the secret sauce, um, but it's certainly uh, something that uh, there's a variety in terms of effectiveness of programs when particular elements are in place. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, what does trained staff mean, right? Like get the details. Um, if trained staff is they're given a copy of the written behavior intervention plan and then plopped in, I will pretty much guarantee that staff is gonna fail because it's very hard to translate just a written document into practice. So we wanna make sure that they are obviously given a copy, someone that actually trains them on it, but they also are able to see other people that are implementing it effectively, appropriately. So we want to ask what that means in terms of training. Are parents involved and engaged in the training process? I think this is the most important point. I think it also for our program at Circle Haven that we're working on, um, that to us was just a foundational element that parents have to be part of the team. They have to be really viewed as part of the team because families obviously sometimes have very important information that could help solve a problem. I mean, I'll give one example, someone that was having problems sleeping and um, the parent noting noticing that they'd put a top sheet on the bed and their loved one had never slept with the top sheet. They felt like their feet were trap down there. They always just had a loose comforter. Um, or even sometimes I gave the, the thing about orange juice. Sometimes, again, um, that just might have been a long history in the past, and it just didn't get to anyone on intake or even asked on intake. Um, so I think making sure that parents are involved in that. How are the changes when there is a change to the plan? How is that shared? And um, you you know the, what I was describing, where you have that um, a mechanism that staff not only is given the change, but there's a way that they acknowledge that they got it. There's I've even seen programs just do it with just simple systems using like Google Groups, uh, so you can certainly monitor to see that someone has actually looked that there is a change. But nothing substitutes having clinicians be really a part on site you know, looking and watching, okay? Um, again, how how do we share this information? So it's not just families with staff, but also shift to shift. In that Rowan grant, when they went out and talked to direct support professionals, the direct support professional, professionals had a lot of frustrations in terms of, you know, 
just when there was a change that, you know, it's only put over here in this book as opposed to it being something that they see once they're signing in. So we want to make sure that um, uh, they get that. When a new person comes on, so some programs too, you'll see like when someone's just coming into the program, they do do all of this. They do have the families meet with them. They may even have a family video that a staff member watches. Um, one thing that I always suggest to families, particularly in registration, residential, make your own about sheet. We, in ours is called about Andrew, because that's my son's name. The most critical things, almost thinking like if I was going to leave a babysitter, I would tell them like he loves videos, but he can't rewind it himself. He needs assistance. Um, his favorite drink is high C juice boxes, those type of things. So um, we sometimes see that when people are first coming into programs, there's a lot of that sharing information, but it doesn't continue as new staff comes on. So we, we want to make sure that, that they're there as well. Um, another point too is, does the program ever share good news? Sometimes families, that phone rings and break out into a sweat or the text comes or you see the emails come in or there's a message left and you think, oh no, what happened today? I think it's really, really critical that good news, happy things, success are shared with, with families, with staff even. So in one of the Google systems that we've used, that we've looked at, we actually have a celebrations and shout outs section. So people, staff can take a look at that. And it might be like, here's a picture of everyone successfully going to a hockey game. And there's a photo there. It's not only makes everyone feel positive about what's happening, but the individuals that made that happen and allowed that to happen, it's a way to recognize them. So I just think that there's really, really important that that's shared with everyone. Um, and I think it really does, it's really sort of evidence of uh, respecting families, having empathy for how difficult it is for them to make the decision, particularly in a residential situation, to make that decision to place residentially. Next slide, please. Parental engagement. So this, again, ideas from across the country of things that um, we saw programs do. So a fundamental, a parent meetings even held. You want to look at like, are there mechanisms to try to get parents together, right? Um, and also if they have them, don't make it impossible to hold a parent meeting. Like make it, they can participate via conference call or a Zoom. You don't have to only be there. What kind of opportunities are there for parents to meet each other and particularly how new families are connected with other families? This is probably the most important though, other than fundraising committees, because also in agencies do a good job at reaching out for that, but do they serve on substantive committees, like things that address you know, quality, agency goals, strategic plans? I think that to me is really the piece um, that's been the hallmark of quality programs. And it's not just the programs allowing the parents in, it's a parent approaching the program with an idea and a sense and a belief that this is a we, not a us versus them. And I understand there are some agencies where that culture and dynamic is very strong, um, that, you know, that the parents are separate. But I think when you look at programs that are really working, people are happy, they're successful, the person served being successful. It is where parents are a part of the agency itself. Um, you know, do they have a parent sitting on the human rights committee even? Um, you know, this is not a residential program. My son was very blessed to be able to be a student at Alpine Learning Group, which is an excellent ABA program um, when he was, you know, a student. And um, I, that program, I've always had such tremendous respect for that, uh, that executive director because everything that happened in that program, parents were always invited on in the planning process. And when there were problems to look at for solutions or when you wanted to start something new that, Yes, we would like to do adult services, but we're going to need job sites having families involved too. Uh, another thing that we've seen in other programs, agency conducting family satisfaction surveys. So, you know, people anonymously can report how they're feeling and do they share the results with everyone to say that, look, it looks like everyone is, you know, dissatisfied with the frequency of parent meetings, something like that. How about the board of directors or the parents on the board of directors? Does the board ever interact with families 
Do they ever hold open meetings so families can address their concern or share ideas? Um, is there a parent advisory uh, board? Um, do they require a monetary donation to participate? So that that's often not a good thing, right? We wanna be able to have that open for everyone. Um, and you wanna make sure that people, um, everyone has access to leadership. Next slide, please. So I guess the best way to sort of look at this is what are, what are these basic things, these you know really important key elements? What are the things that welcome, connect, and inform families? So making an email and phone list available to of everyone, uh, committee, staff, board, leadership, and families. Um, I have this on the bottom, but I'll jump to it right away. Whose HIPAA rights are they? Sometimes we hear where families say, I want to connect with other families. Oh, we can't because of HIPAA. So HIPAA is something that if you are a guardian, you have the ability to share your information, your child's information. So what I often suggest to families is put your information on a card with a little note and ask the staff to share that with the other parent. Now the other parent, they can't give you the other parent's information, but they certainly can share yours if you've given permission to do that. And I think that that is really, really helpful. Um, also, asking you know on the agency what opportunities are there for families to get involved because i've seen that too where there were really good committees people looking at um you know we want parents want to start more recreation or even willing to do an event to support that but not every family even knew about those efforts uh, i think another important key component of quality services when you're talking about serving individuals that are complex and particularly have, with challenging behaviors you know, what's the role of clinicians, right? So we don't want leadership to only be accountants and development people in public relations, but that clinicians are uh, very much in decision-making leadership roles because sometimes you can develop a policy and it just doesn't make sense from a, political, uh, a clinical perspective. Um, the role of families again. Some so obviously early on I gave lots of examples of that, but these are these are you know areas, and sometimes these are things to even just existing programs to be talking to leadership or working with other families and improving that. Next slide, please. So um, this obviously this is in particular in New Jersey that we have our tier systems. So we want to make sure that. Um, you know, the more complex acuity cases are not just coming in and just supporting um, those with lower budgets. Um, it it re Now, DDD does not require where an agency shows like penny for penny of what your loved one's budget is, is used. It all does go into a pot because together you do support things like another director or a clinician. But the way to best look at this and to ensure that uh, your loved one is getting what they need is having that written plan, making sure that there are details about the services, specified goals with, speci with specificity. So you don't want to just say, um, there's a community goal, you'll get into the community. Maybe you want to say, we'll actually go to the following places and at that place, we'll do the particular task, like fill up their soda cup independently. Um, this one I've just seen on rare occasion, but I do mention it. Um, where uh, providers have said, um, oh, if you want to go, you know, to the Y for swimming, you'll have to pay extra for, you know, staff to be able to come and take them. There really is under CMS, which is Center for Medicaid Services, which is where the funding comes from. It is federal state matching dollars and the federal rules require that individuals have access to the community. Um, now, again, it is... Um, there's lots of barriers to that frequently, um, but it is something that you should always be asking for and certainly not charge more for it. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is sort of that second, second topic, which I'm going to run through really quickly because it does come up in this, is that I mentioned about HCBS. So home and community-based services are the waiver funds that we get in New Jersey and throughout the country. But um, in particular, this is how we fund our DDD services. 
And there has been, there was a period of time where it was very restrictive. Um, there was, uh, you know, uh, some people actually had, there was a policy for a while at the federal government since been changed, but they also did allow states to be stricter if they wanted. And um, the good news is that New Jersey um, is very open to these alternative models, but um, we do want to ask this question because families will say, well, I really would like an intentional community or a farm community, but I heard we're not allowed to do that. So I want to just talk a little bit about that. The answer is you are. Next, next slide, please. So these are, again, some, um, I would say, resources, National Council of Severe Autism, when we, uh, which was at the earlier slide, uh, when we're asked to weigh in on, uh, you know, what should our options be available? Because there was a very strong inclusion movement and that absolutely has its place. Um, but just because someone is in a, an apartment, uh, you know, an integrated setting or in a community-based group, it doesn't mean they're getting any more access to the community, right? Like big isn't always bad, good isn't always small. Uh, you really have to look at the experience of the individuals that live there. So those are the arguments that we made first federally, then state by state. And these are some organizations. And it really is about, well, they sh people with disabilities should have the same choices, right? I live in an over 55 community. No one said there's too many of us. We wouldn't for other uh, things say, oh, only 25% of the people here could be female or African-American or of a certain uh, race or religion. Or, um, so it really was about a variety of choices. Um, and as I said, when we were fighting in New Jersey and were successful, this was one of my favorite testimony with someone that just said, who was a person served, I would like to live in a farm with my friends. And they were very effective advocates. Next slide, please. So we did get federal clarification, which is great, which is really um, looking at um, the experience of people instead of the setting itself. And it's probably the most important thing is that quote down there where we did get directly from the Center for Medicaid Services. That was actually under the Trump administration and the Biden administration has continued that. And given how many programs have grown relying on that, I think it would be really shocking to see a reverse of this. Um, but we did get in mind that you can use your HCBS funds for these alternatives that we're talking about. Next slide, please. Okay, all right, got through it in exactly the time I wanted to with 15 minutes. So I'm gonna take a look down at the chat and see if you have any questions. Here's another, doesn't, gives them that. There's a 2.5. Like I said, this is a very specific question, really more related actually to a school district case. Um, so I think a real true FBA. So just so you know, they often will use that too. They'll say something is a behavior assessment, but it's not truly an FBA. So a, a true functional behavior assessment, and you can go on, um, there's a national association, the Association for Behavior Analysts that have a lot of good materials on it. And what says New Jersey does as well. That a true one is where you're doing an assessment of that individual person, right? Um, and also there's a third step with actually manipulating the circumstances to get a function of the behavior. Now, when, so an FBA is really looking at the function of behavior. In terms of looking at what goals are appropriate, there's other assessment tools that you would you could use for that. Uh, for older students, an AFLS is one example, which is the assessment for functional living skills. Us, the Vineland can be helpful as well too. Um, but I think also getting a skilled practitioner in there, a behavior analyst that not only thinks their role is to reduce behaviors, but their role is to uh, teach skills, to enhance someone's life, to give them more things that they might enjoy. They often are the ones that have, you know, the best ideas. I had an independent consultant who came in and said, stop counting the money, use a debit card. And it made a big difference, right? Um, so that's, I hope I answered that. Doesn't look like we have anything else in the chat which I don't think that's the first time that happened. Is anyone having trouble with um, posting in the chat? Hmm. 
Okay, let's see. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I'm not going to end early. I'll talk a little more if people want to hear. Oh, it looked like we did just get one. I just, oh, that was just a thank you to the answer to that question. Okay. We have a siren on our elementary school. The siren is used to alert firefighters. Let me just open this. I'm not sure why this is not opening all the way. Okay, so more of a school district question again, as opposed to uh, you know looking at programs particularly for this. So I'm assuming this parent is asking about that their individual has a um, negative reaction to when the siren goes off, um, or even um, if a pager or a cell phone rings. Um, so. Um, there are, yes, people are entitled to reasonable accommodations, but they're also, you have to have a safe operation of a program, right? So I don't see how they're going to say, we're just not going to use the siren if that is obviously in their protocol for safety. But there, I would look at it a couple different ways. One, in terms of accommodation, maybe there's an area that is quieter, so they could actually let the teacher know, so the person could be moved to that. Some individuals, just knowing that it's going to happen is helpful to them. Um, another thing is also, too, I've had cases where a behavior analyst came in and helped work on desensitizing the person to it. So not just loud things like sirens, but all sorts of stimuli, uh, uh, dogs even. Um, so there are some definite protocols that people can fo you know, follow um, that would just literally starting with a picture of the bell and then a short thing of the, the bell. Um, let's see, this town has eight sirens within two pins and miles of land. I, I honestly, I don't know what the, the reg is in terms of that. I would imagine probably a school board attorney would be able to answer that. I don't know if that's excessive or not. Um, but I would say there's something I would ask the, talk to the principal about, your director of special services, and possibly even the fire department, see what's required. But in terms of how you are dealing, there are some things that, you know, um, like I'll one that comes up in a group home is that they do have to periodically, or also a campus cluster, you know, uh, any time a residential program, they do have to periodically have a middle of the night fire um, drum. And I've had individuals who've said that is horrible because the person is going to have a behavior and it's going to be dangerous. And so there I have seen circumstances where they, again, have, you know, done it much earlier than the middle of the night, have told the person about it beforehand, made sure everything was ready, like the coat was available and there was even another place to go so they weren't standing outside. But, um, you know, tragedies do happen where um, someone hasn't practiced that and learned to follow the command. Um, we have had individuals, we've had a uh, horrific situation with National Council of Severe Autism. One of our board members actually perished in a fire with her son with autism because he would not follow the command when uh, they had a fire in the home and he would not follow her command of leaving. And they unfortunately both who are, you know, perish from smoke inhalation. So there are some things that I know are real difficult for our loved ones, but you just, they're, they're necessary because the alternative could be even, even more dangerous. Okay, I'm gonna go here. Okay, I'm only seeing that in the chat. Well, you're quite a quiet group. We usually have more questions than I can get to. Don't know if anybody, does it take a minute to post anything? Okay, all right. Well, then let me uh, actually take time to talk a little bit about those organizations that I was talking about. So, um, Kareen, I don't know if there's a possibility to go all the way back to the first, one of the early, early slides where I had. Yeah, okay. So, these are just really wonderful organizations that provide so many resources, particularly for individuals that have challenging behavior, but they are also 
um, Coalition for Community Choice and Together for Choice are much broader than that because they are looking at models for any um, individual with any uh, disability, um, any intellectual disability, a developmental disability, or even physical disabilities. So uh, I already talked a little bit about the National Council of Severe Autism. I'm actually on the board of directors there. That is... Um, Really, the primary focus is to advocate for this segment of the population, because uh, sometimes policies will be made which are uh, well intentioned and absolutely serve one, um, you know, end of the spectrum, but may not work for a nonverbal person, a person with challenging behaviors. Uh, so they do a lot of monitoring of when laws are passed or policies come out, but also just sharing information um, through the webinars or connecting parents. Uh, so I would definitely recommend them. They lots of they bring in a lot of good information from other organizations. The Coalition for Community Choice, this organization grew out of the crazy few years we had where the Center for Medicaid at the federal level went a little bonkers because they there is there's a law and then there's regs and then there are um, you know clarifications that people ask it's actually called guidance and people started to write in um, when they were doing reviews of programs to say you can't use home and community-based dollars which are basically your dollars that fund your waiver in New Jersey in institutional settings and people ask well what is an institution and rather than saying a nursing home or developmental center they went broader than that and said, well, any place that's not allowing access to the community and, you know, they may not be allowed or they may have to go through an extra review. And they gave farmsteads as an example. And what happened is that farmsteads around the country and organizations that wanted to have farmsteads and parents that were looking to hopefully eventually have their child in farmstead, the Coalition for Community Choice really brought everyone together each state had to write a plan to say what they would allow or not allow. They literally read every statewide transition plan. They were acted as a resource for when people were trying to get their plans changed. Now they even do a really wonderful thing in that there is within their website, there's a way to connect with other communities and there's also community profiles. So if people wanna find out what else is out there and available, they're doing some really wonderful things. Um, Desiree Kamika, who is really was the original moving force behind it, um, she actually came to New Jersey when we got our first SCP. That I don't know if any of you, uh, you know, remember it, but it was actually terrifying because it not only said no campuses, no intentional communities, no clusters, um, you know, no two houses next to each other, but crazy rules for day programs even that you had to be out in the community for x percentage of the time of the day which just was impractical and we had people forced to just walking laps in the mall just to say they were in the community as opposed to quality programming so new jersey does um uh, oh thanks to the coalition of community choice because they really came in and educated us about what the law really said what the advocacy efforts are uh and also um you know what were some other model uh, statewide transition plans. And now New Jersey does have actually a very good one. You do still have to show that your program is gonna allow access to the community. So you don't wanna build a campus that no one ever leaves. They have to use only you as a provider for a job coach or for your related services. Uh, there's not an effort to integrate people to for the community. So there's things that they're going to look at that make sure that there's choice and access, but it flipped it. So there's not a bar that you, because it was the wrong emphasis. They were looking at the structure and the model as opposed to the experience of the individuals living there. Because as I said, a, a community-based group home that's supposedly the most inclusive can be sometimes the most isolating, right? We have people that go from their group home to their van to their day program and then back to the group home and there's not any interaction with the community. So we really, Coalition for Community Choice was largely responsible for getting for CMS. They didn't have to change the law. The law itself was actually not bad. It was the interpretation of the law and they were a driving force. 
couple of years after that, another organization grew up called Together for Choice. That was actually grew first out of a wonderful campus program in Chicago called Misericordia, this fabulous program, um, and then went national. But it really was, um, I would say, uh, professionals and parents out, out of that program that you know, supported at first is now a national organization. They have done a lot of the hard work lobbying. They um, will do, you know, a day on the Capitol and then look for, we're doing New Jersey this month. Anyone from New Jersey want to come? And it helped us change that Medicaid rule. It also now they are involved in, uh, again, advocating. So if a bill comes out, it looks like it's going to not really be available for people that have more significant needs. Um, the Misericordia Center is not uh, only, only for individuals with uh, severe disabilities, but also significantly medical fragile as well, too. Uh, so again, as I said, they now have an executive director, a board across the country. They're really terrific. And one of the things that they do, which I really like, is that they periodically do a member focus. So they will just have a one hour webinar where a program will come in and say, come learn about um, Benjamin's Hope, which is a campus-based program in Michigan. And Benjamin's Hope will do a presentation um, and be available for questions. So it's a great place to not only be an advocate to make sure the laws and regs and funding flows to everyone, but also in sharing ideas and resources and models. It's really, a, really a wonderful organization. So I urge you all to take a look at that. Um, I don't know if Together for Choice is free for membership, um, but it was not a large cost. Um, and the other two are, are free for membership. As I said, also too, that Coalition for Community Choice has this great section too, where it can connect projects with each other. And I've seen projects that were in the making connect through the Coalition for Community Choice. And they have members that do all sorts of things, including mixed communities, ones where it serves both seniors and people with developmental disabilities, one where the housing units are part of a, a commercial development, where the housing units are also in with family units and even market rate units. Um, I've even seen them have one where it was um, um, where, you know, there were homes, and homes for parents to buy, but also in another part of the community, um, residents for the individuals with the developmental disabilities. So they're just, they are really a wonderful resource. If you are running the program or talking to a program or looking at doing something new and innovative, and, and I do um, actually would really like to end on this point, which is that New Jersey is actually in a really good place, in a bad place in that we need so much, so much more, there's no doubt. But I am very optimistic that the landscape is changing and will look very different as each year passes because they are approving all of these things campuses, clusters, intentional communities. Um, and one community organization I would point to, uh, Bergen County United Way, who has done such wonderful work. I actually worked with them at the very start, their very first project in Allendale. For a while, we got stalled when things were sort of crazy at the federal level. When that was clarified, they were off and running again, and they're they're building all sorts of things. Um, their floor and park one, I think it's over a hundred units. So um, that is a really good New Jersey resource. If you go on their website, they actually have a special needs housing. You can see the projects they've done already and their projects that are in the pipeline. And um, in recent years, they are doing more and more that are just you know a whole mixture of things. Um, I know they've got a South Orange one that's going to be a mixture for families and individuals with developmental developmental disabilities. And they've also done uh, units that are for independent living. So people are able to get the housing voucher, get affordable rent that have minimal support needs. And they've also done license setting for people with complex needs that need 24 seven. So that that's really, we're very, very lucky to have Bergen County United Way that really started the movement in New Jersey and now is really continuing at full force. 
So let's see, we don't have any questions. So I guess I should be happy about that. I hope it was uh, helpful and I was able to answer everyone's questions that had them. And um, again, take a look at these organizations. There's some really exciting things happening out there. All right, enjoy the rest of your lunch. Have a great day. Bye-bye.